Hello everyone, Jackson here on behalf of Torfine.com and Future Days, and today it's another exciting episode of Artist Interviews. Today I'm sitting with Edward Transylvania. How are you doing today, Edward? I'm doing well, Jack. Thank you for inviting me. I love you and Evie, and I've been watching some of your episodes. They're really fun to watch, insightful, and I'm doing well for the most part. How are you? Well, that's pretty great to hear. I'm, I'm doing pretty well, too. I mean, today's day number one of a of kind of a little mini vacation for me, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, sun's out today. You know, it's nice, beautiful weather. Birds are chirping. You know, I'd say all in all, things are pretty good considering the state of the world. And, you know, but in my own little backyard, I think things are pretty good. And I uh, see so you got your little drink there. Yeah, and, and I'm assuming you have yours? Uh, yes, in my Johnny Rockets cup right here. Salud. Correct. Cheers. Cheers. So today we're going to ask you a couple of questions and see where it goes from here. Are you ready to get into it? Let's do it. What are three of your most memorable moments from your musical career? Well, to quote Sinatra, I did it my way. There's been some pretty exciting experiences. There's been some situations that have presented themselves that I never thought would ever have come to be there's been some horrible moments but they're all equally just as amazing an experience because you know you learn from them i remember the first time experiment perilous got together with the lineup that i currently have because it went through different lineup changes and its origins you know as it typically happens with most bands but there was a band called deadbeat sinatra that was a local la band they're all we're all good friends we all grew up together Debbie Sinatra, the singer and guitarist, sat in with Experiment Perilous for a while during its beginning stages when, um, you know, we were just writing songs, getting together. And I had a different drummer and different keyboardist at the time. They were brothers. So, you know, it was from a previous band I had called The Mind. So we were kind of just transitioning into the next evolution of it, I guess. But then, you know, Experiment Perilous was its own entity and it wasn't really working out with these two guys. So... Adrian did me the favor of sitting in for a long time, which is great. You know, he, he really he really was in there when I needed him. Then I got Hart, which was the drummer for Deadbeat Sinatra. Well, actually, he was a guitarist and drummer. He was drummer, then guitarist, to sit in on drums. And then I always had Joe. Joe was always by my side, the bass player for Experiment Perilous. And he, you know, he was always by my side. So then we had one of our first rehearsals with Hart and Adrian. And, you know, and myself and Joe, and we just kind of revamped all the songs. It was amazing. It was energetic. And then, you know, eventually, you know, Adrian went back to his full-time thing with Debbie Sinatra. And in that, Hart moved up to guitar because he's also a phenomenal guitarist. And then again, I went to Debbie Sinatra and I got their drummer, Larry, to sit in for a few shows with us. Then he wound up becoming a permanent member because our, our spiritual connections with each other not only having a family background, because we all grew up together, you know, except Joe, but Joe was already, you know, he was already on my side since the beginning. I think that first show we did as like what would then become the lineup for Experiment Perilous, probably one of my best because it was filled with so much magic, intensity, mistakes, dramas. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible, when I think about it, I still get the chills. So that's one of them. And another one would be with Experiment Perilous. We you know we were playing a lot of the LA circuit, you know, every club, death rock club, goth, punk rock, rockabilly, even psychabilly events. We know we were booked on everything, which is great because I always thought we're a very versatile band. We can pretty much meet any audience in, in their own terms kind of thing. And kind of give them a new kick up the, you know, up the arse kind of thing, you know, like show them a new kind of kick, you know, in the words of Lux. But one thing I, I noticed was a lot of it was becoming, I won't say repetitious, but it was, we were getting too comfortable, you know, being contacted by certain promoters to play these certain events. It was great. It was cool. You know, it was, it was fun and it was good. And I, I loved that we had that respect and people expressed interest in us. But I wanted to do things a certain way. So I took that whole mentality that, you know, the whole early punk rock do it yourself mentality of putting shows together on my own. And, and, and I did, you know, and some were successful, some were, you know, terribly, you know, awful. But 
the experience itself was, you know, it's pretty good for me. So getting back to some of the, the memorable moments, I, I, I wound up eventually coming into contact with Brando. Fuck you, Brando. Von Badsville from uh, Spikes. And through him, I got to, I found a venue that was home. I, I'd gone to Spikes before anyway. And I, I mean, that place was just a home away from home. But through him, I found a venue that I could call like my home for any ideas I had. They never, they never judged them. They were open to it, you know, and spikes in its early beginnings, you know, they went through, you know, various permutations, if you will. But in its early beginnings is a very, it was a very rockabilly bar, rock and roll, you know, biker bar. And it, it all, it always remained the same. It always st stood true to his roots. But it was there was such a punk rock vibe about the venue. I mean, you played there. I mean, you you, you get it. You walk in, and there's just some kind of magic about the place. So many history, so much history there. So I found this. You know, I found Spikes as a home. So I was able to pretty much take risks. They were allowing me to take risks. Other promoters that allowed me to do you know, events at their at their clubs weren't really as open minded because a lot of it you know has to do with revenue. You know, the overhead and you know what the bar's taking back kind of thing. A lot of owners of the specific venue, you know, they just want to make money. The cool thing about Spikes is, yeah, it was about making money, but they kind of gave me the freedom to do whatever the fuck I wanted, and I did. So having that, knowing that, I was able to reach out to people like David J., you know, from Love and Rockets, Bar House, to come DJ there. And he agreed to do it, and he did. And it was an incredible, phenomenal night. You know, David J. even introduced Experiment Panelists that night. And when we, were, when we were performing, the one thing that kind of just hit me in the middle of the set, of the, of the set was how many, you know, all, all my teen years and stuff like that, right? How much time did I spend, spend looking at, you know, the Bauhaus videos, Bauhaus live in concert videos, you know, kind of thing. You know, the, the archive videos, the, you know, Shadow of Light, you know, the, the, the Love and Rockets videos, you know, how much time did I spend going to Love and Rockets shows, seeing Peter Murphy live? all that stuff. And I'm looking in the audience and he's staring right at us. Kind of like, you know, bobbing his head a little. I was like a fucking magical moment. Like all those years I was looking at him bobbing my head to, you know, to his, to his art. It, you know, even for a split second, it turned around and he was doing it for mine. And that was pretty incredible. Same thing with like, um, I reached out, I, I, with that, I wound up getting the confidence to kind of keep going with that. I reached out to people like Mark Burgess from the Chameleons and you know, he came down, he DJed. We had such an incredible time. The after parties were insane, but insanely good. You know, I mean, there was always a, a risk of something kind of probably going awry, but fortunately the people that we trusted to be around us were respectful and everything was just amazing. He had a blast. We had a blast. He wound up spending him and his girlfriend who's fiance now, at the time wound up spending the night at my place. Cause you know, we just got way, we got way too loaded when we left the night, when we left spikes the night when he DJed, I went to the bar and I, Tony, the owner, I said, Hey man, can I grab a couple of bottles of Jack? You know, we're going to, you know, this party isn't over yet. You guys got to take him. You know, that's, that's, that's what he sounded. So we grabbed them, you know, Esther wound up meeting us at this, this after hours that we heard about. And the cool thing about that after hours, when we walked in, pretty much everyone that was there at Spikes was at this after hours hotel. It's like a roadway motel, like one of those like trucker stops kind of place, right? And the girl that was there, the girl who, whose room it was, she went to, you know, to the event. She was really excited to meet Mark, was happy to get a record signed. And Mark was really sweet and, you know, kind of like responsive to the audience. When, when she saw us all walk in, she was like, what the fuck, right? So it was just an incredible night. And when Mark spent the night at my place, we were watching uh, Elvis' 68 comeback, you know, the comeback special. And I love Elvis, you know, my Elvis fanatic. So we were watching that for a little bit. You know, we were commenting how incredible he was, how magnificent he was. I mean, look at him. He was like, he knew how to market himself. He was beautiful. You know, his, he had a magnificent voice. His talents were really in his voice and his presentation. We're going back and forth on that, taking shots. And then next thing you know, we're both singing um, uh, Swamp Thing together because I started singing it and he starts singing with me. 
and it's just you know acapella style it's quiet we're doing it then we start laughing and take a shot and that i never thought that would happen because just years before that i had seen the chameleons at the knitting factory and what i thought you know i'd be hanging out with mark now i didn't and you know it happened and that kind of kept me going you know i invited daniel ash i reached out to daniel ash to come dj at spikes he came down he dj'd experiment perilous performed that night and, and it was that same magical moment like with david and and mark when we're performing daniel and his girlfriend are sitting there drinking and i'm looking at him and, and it hits me fuck this is daniel ash watching us play you know and he was rocking out he gave me a cheers kind of thing and it was just it was just a, a chill that just it's beyond words you know it's kind of like one of those when you think about it and you look back it's kind of like yeah you know it, it happened and it's part of my rock and roll history so those those probably are some of the most memorable but there's also i mean there's just too many to really narrow it down to three because you know recently I, i've i got together with a with a group of friends and artists that i love and we formed a what began as a bowie tribute band called stardust heroes and our connection with each other our you know rapport was incredible so kind of what began as a Bowie tribute evolved into its own entity, its own, you know, musical experience. Like it demanded its own identity kind of thing. And we started working on, you know, on original material that just began sounding more and more incredible. The people in, in um, Stardust Heroes I've worked with before in some capacity. So the famili familiarity was there and we're just, it's just like for me, creating art in any level any aspect of it whether it's poetry whether it's music painting sculpture ex you know expressing yourself that alone is rewarding there's nothing in this earth that can compare to that other, other than other than love but that's a form of love a different kind of love but it falls into that uh, it falls under that same beautiful experience of being human those are some amazing moments, I'll tell you right there. I mean, having those moments where, you know, you get to, yes, cr you know, have a stage for yourself to be creative, you know what I mean, to to bring in all of these amazing artists. And Spikes, you know, yes, it am was an amazing venue. A lot of amazing things happened there, a lot of great moments. You know, but then you being able to be up there and, and, and perform and then have these people that you love and admire like actually like taking the time to experience your art and enjoy it. That, that right there is, it's gotta be like one of those moments where you're kind of going like, holy shit, I cannot believe this is happening. This is like these, these little, these little things in life that you just don't expect, you know, and being able to, <laughs> you've been able to hang out with Mark Burgess and sing Swamp Thing. I mean, that, <laughs> that must have been a sight to see, I'm telling you. It's pretty you know, incredible. Right? Yeah. Another incredible moment there were so many but this kind of just triggered it right now thanks to um to um bruce you know moreland phenomenal artist he's been in the alley circuit for years with everything he's done you know with so many amazing amazing historical bands he's like an alley fixture you know there's there there should be a statue with bruce holding a fucking crow and just pointing to the stars you know thanks to bruce though I reached out to him about an idea I had for an event at Spikes. He did his thing. He got back to me. He introduced me to the people I needed to talk to. And from that came the Thrill Kill Cult at Spikes. And that's when you guys opened up for them. That right there was was a cherry on top, really. You know, that that right there was 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 like one of those moments where you kind of go, like, I cannot believe that I'm here doing this event. Uh here at this venue and i'm getting to play with my life with the thrill kill cult and ravens Moreland. like that right there was like holy shit like this is like one of those moments where you're kind of going like i know for you know myself i was like floored but evie you know she was like oh my god you know being able to play a show <laughs> with one of the bands that she's loved for years and years and years and years was just like one of those moments where it was just like jaw on the floor kind of thing you are the man behind putting that thing together i mean like you getting everybody like talking with with uh with uh, bruce and everything like being able to set that all up that was like 
such an amazing moment that we are very thankful for that you were able to include us in. And uh, I, that goes down in, in my memory, in my history books, it's like one of the top moments of my life. Well, thank you. I mean, I was glad you guys were able to participate at that moment when everything was green lit and I knew it was going to happen. No questions asked. It's going, it's going down. Buzz was just an amazing person to work with and groovy man. I mean, come on, the guy's fucking a legend. When I knew everything was, was set in stone, there was no, no more obstacles. And the, the agreement when the understanding was like, a handshake. I mean, there was, you know, the business side of it was there and you know, that was taken care of quickly. And the, it was, it was like, it's a go. I thought, okay, who can I get to open for them? And I, I want it to be in the same vibe. And all my friends that have told me, oh, I'll throw kill calls one of my favorite bands. And you know, I never forget stuff like that. I remember you saying, you know, uh, the throw kill call was one of her, you know, favorite all time bands. So automatically, you know, I thought of Jackson, Bruce, since he helped put the whole thing together, I got, you know, I got, you know, Ravens Moreland involved, which was fucking amazing that night, along with you guys. And of course, Digital Betty, I know they've always been, you know, they've always listed Throw Kill Cult as one of their influences. So, and I reached out to them. DJ wise, it was obvious, you know, I wanted to, you know, Esser, Dave Batts. I mean, it was just a fucking, it was just a for the circle of, of, I call it family, you know, we're all like a big family, our circle of friends and family, which reaches out everywhere. I mean, there's so many people that have been involved and in keeping the Los Angeles scene alive for many, many years. And, you know, it's not to discount anybody else who's outside of, you know, what I consider my family. You know, I, I you know, cheers to them. I give, you know, you have all my respect. Cheers. But that night, you know, any, if anyone still has a poster or flyer, if you look at everybody that was involved that evening, it was all family. And when Groovy Man and Buzz met everybody, they were like, every, it's like everybody already knew each other. It was just incredible. You know, everyone was taking shots, drinking. You know, I'm sure the booze had a lot to do with it, but the majority of it was just such a comfortable atmosphere. The DJs were phenomenal. Everyone, every, everywhere I looked, everyone had a smile on their face. And that's what it's about for me. You know, it's about feeling that reward. You know, there's, if, if you can use the word revolt, reward, but feeling that like, that fulfilling, accomplished reward, that this night was a success not because of the capacity of people that were there to support the event. I mean, that did help. That did help a lot. But because everybody involved could not stop talking about it for weeks later. Magic. You're right. It is magic right there, you know, in a nutshell. You know what I mean? You helped create this magic. All the events that you've done there, all the events that you've been a part of, you know, you have helped to create some really amazing moments here in Los Angeles to help bring in some amazing artists. And really, it all is a whole family scene. You know what I mean? It is a whole family scene. And uh, everybody always gets along really, really well. And to all of us out here, hats off to you for bringing some amazing events. What would you say is your favorite album slash EP that you've ever worked on? All of them. I mean, there's, there's no particular. Everything I've been involved in, I've loved. What was the drive behind getting you into making music and performing live? That comes from a very early age. I've always loved art, music, you know, and there's all forms of it, literature. You know, it's, it's all part of the same, the same web. Growing up, growing up, um, I, I spent as a boy, I spent a lot of time alone. You know, that was just, you know, circumstances of the time. And my escape was always music, music, comic books, you know, stories where my imagination can run wild. Sometimes I learned at an early age, sometimes in life, you have a difficult time expressing yourself, expressing how you feel at least for me, I can't say one, I can't, I can't 
assume it relates to a lot of people. I'm sure it does. But specifically for me, I had a difficult time. Ex and, and early on in life, I realized I had a difficult time expressing myself. And it was very difficult for me to let out some emotion in what I was feeling. I always kept a lot of things bottled in. And my release was writing about it. I was, you know, I was, when I was a, a kid, I was, you know, I was, I was a, a firecracker. I was, you know, really a hothead. You know, I was very emotional. And a lot of the reasons I didn't know where that was coming, a lot of the times, I didn't know where that was coming from. It was just kind of like impulsive. Impulsive, it was, uh, I, I think, just my surroundings. I don't know. I mean, I do know now that I'm a lot older, you know, I've, I've analyzed and thought of things. And it's just, it's just who I was at that time. And I remember my mother was very always supportive. I, mean, I love that woman to death. She's like, you know, my hero. She recommended, you know, try doing something productive instead of destructive. Because destructive was always, you know, being the hothead and just exploding and, you know, getting into trouble. And the, the, what, I, what I discovered to be productive was writing how you feel. Writing it down in a diary, poetry, however. Write it down. Evaluate it later. And see what you can do to change about yourself to fix that situation or that feeling. So I did that a lot. You know, and, and this is when I was a little boy and I, you know, I kept doing that up to my teens. You know, the very first time I saw the very first record I ever purchased was David Bowie's Aladdin Sane record. The first time I saw it, there was this, this record store in Montebello called Roadhouse Records. You know, I, I mentioned this before in a previous uh, podcast. If, if you grew up in the 80s, you're going to remember that a lot of the, the stores would put the album cover out in the window, like, you know, put them all up in the window. And when I saw it, I, was, I don't know how old it was, 10, I don't know. I thought it was a painting, an amazing painting, beautiful painting. So I went in and I said, hey, how much is that? And I didn't have enough for it. I came back, you know, a week or so later and I bought it. And a habit I always have, and to this day I still do it, I always read the lyrics first in a record and then I listen to the record because I always like to imagine what that's going to sound like and how did they, you know, how did, how, how, how did this person manage to convey that into, you know, art kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm wording it a lot more technical now, but back then, you know, I just thought like, I want to, I want to know how this came out. So I put the record on and Oh my God, it blew my mind. It was just instant love. You know, and, and through Bowie, I discovered, you know, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, The Velvet Underground. I mean, so many just incredible artists that to this day are still my main source of influence, you know, to an extent. I mean, um, uh, these are people I deeply love, you know, Jim Morris and The Doors, stuff like that. But what got me to do it is like I would see all these videos of Iggy, of Bowie, you know, of Lou Reed and The Velvet Underground especially with Lou Reed, you know, some of the videos I saw of him, you know, he was completely out of his mind, you know, with Iggy Pop, you know, he was like, he could, you know, he, he it sounded like he couldn't sing, but he's singing and, you know, what he's, what he's expressing right there, that's how I feel sometimes kind of thing, you know, like, and he's banging everything up and he doesn't give a shit and he looks amazing doing it. And that's how I feel. That's how I feel a lot of the time. Then I would see Bowie, you know, play, you know, Starman or something, you know, on, on the BBC shows. And, you know, he's, he's so, he looks so fragile, so delicate, like a flower. You know, he looked like such a beautiful flower. And if the petal fell, it would be, if sorrow had a sound, it would sound like that in my, in my head kind of thing. And then, you know, I would see like, you know, Jim Morrison in the doors and, you know, he would just express whatever he felt. He said it, he did it. So that was probably what gave me the confidence to do it. And I remember when I was in high school, this little group of metalhead guys I knew, you know, they formed a band for the talent show and they asked me to sing. And I was like the complete opposite of them. You know, I had the, the whole, I had, you know, my, back, my, my hair was to the side. It was long in the front. You know, my friend Ruben and I, who I've known till I, from the day I was born, we were like the, you know, the little goth subculture kids, but everyone got along. See, all these, the I, I always like to mention this, all these stories you hear, how, a lot of people didn't get along in the 80s. That's all bullshit. Or at least for me, it wasn't like that. All the metalheads, all the punks, all the goths, all the new wavers, because there was a shitload of new wavers and new romantics in the 80s in high school. It was like one big tribe. 
even like the cholos that hung out at the backyard parties and the you know pushing everybody in the pit kind of thing they they were all into the, into the music and nobody really judged each other because everybody was different you know everybody there was different so a lot of us got along i mean we made fun of each other but that goes you know that's that high school mentality but anyway so they asked me to sing right for it for the band and i think it was a Black Sabbath's Children of the Grave. It was Black Sabbath's Children of the Grave. And I'd never really heard Black Sabbath then. You know, they, they let me borrow the record and I thought, oh, wow, this is pretty incredible. You know, um, the lyrics to Children of the Grave is just amazing. So I learned the song. We did it. And I just kind of let loose. You know, we didn't, we didn't get picked for the talent show because I was, you know, breaking the mic stand. And I just kind of like let loose. And I knew at that moment, that's what I want to do. Not necessarily as a, you know, successful career to make money, but that's what I wanted to do to express myself. And I pursued it, you know, I never stopped writing. I never, and I, to this day, I still write, you know, um, thoughts, lyrics, notebooks, you know, I, I keep everything. Everything I wrote back then, I have the majority of it still. You know, I've lost a lot of stuff through time, but for the most part, you know, I still have the majority of it. But I, you know, every time, the thing about me, every time I write something, there's a melody to it. Like I hear a certain melody. It doesn't always successfully translate, but I hear it. So that's what kept me going in the early nineties. I formed a band called the mine, which is the one I mentioned to you with some of the guys that when I went on to do experiment perilous and I just let loose. That was like, you know, I, I, a lot of the songs were some really bad poetry I wrote, but it was what it was. And I, I, I would never change it. You know, it was, it was every moment I experienced in that, Everything I've ever done in life, questionable things, beautiful things, horrible things, ugly things, hateful things, uh, you know, sympathetic things, empathy, anything I've ever done in life, I don't regret any of it. Because now, I really like the person I am. Like who, 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 who I, I won't say grew up to be because we're still growing every fucking day. It's still a process. But what I've evolved to be now, I like where my head's at, where my heart's at. You know, one of the, one of the most important things, and this goes back to what drove me to, to perform, one of the most important things I discovered in life, something that's supposed to be so beneficial, so something that's supposed to be inspirational, is some of the, it's, it's probably one of the most difficult things, one of the, one of the, one of the most difficult accomplishments maybe i don't know but every 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 journey toward it is worth it it's just one word love that's very true right there one word love yeah. you know it's it's interesting like how we find ourselves on these different paths you know what i mean like fate it's almost like fate moves us in certain directions you know you knowing at an early age that channeling your energy into into something constructive, you know, something that could really be an, an amazing art form that you eventually embrace. You know, it's like, we don't have a roadmap in life. You know what I mean? We don't have a roadmap and we're constantly growing. We're constantly evolving, you know, as artists and musicians and creators of anything. But it's like, there are moments in life where we kind of, we stand there and we go, am I going to take this opportunity and push forward with it? Or am I going to, am I just going to pull back? There are just moments in life where you kind of go, I'm just going to push forward. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to, I'm going to make something happen. You know, if somebody offers you the microphone and says, Hey, here, sing a few bars. Are you going to like stop and, and stand there and go, no, no way. Or are you just going to say, fuck it. Look at where it's taken you. You have gone on to do some really amazing things and you are still continuing to do some amazing things. A lot of people that I know out there, a lot of people, you know, myself and a lot of the people out there who know you can say the same thing. Good old Edward Transylvania has never shied away from being creative. I'll tell you that. Thank you. That means a lot to me. And literally, thank you. That, that's just, I think that's just kind of like a, that's the hearing something like that is the closest thing to a touch from God and embrace, you know what I mean? Like it's a spiritual thing. So, you know, hearing something like when I use the word God, it's just, I, I strongly believe this is my belief only art music, 
you know, in all its forms, literature, you know, like I mentioned earlier, sculpture, art and music is the thing that's going to save humanity. That's right. That's true. I really believe that as well. I think art and music, the ability to create, I just think it narrows down to the ability to create. If we stay creative, you know what I mean? We can really come up out of the darkest areas in our lives. If we choose to hold on and then we choose to stay imaginative, you know, we choose to kind of fight for the things that we love, we can really make some amazing things happen. We really can. And that right there is what's important. Love. Love and creativity are really, really important. And we should embrace those things and never let them go. I agree 100%. And art comes in so many forms, you know, at the present times we're living in, you know, the, the horrible situations, experiences, things humanity is capable of doing. It's also capable of creating something beautiful from it. You know, something will spawn from it that will hopefully bring a balance. You know, people that are out there protesting, standing up for what they believe in, or just have had enough of everything that they hold to be like a complete disregard for human life, human existence, that itself is a form of art. You know, it takes a lot of passion to get to kind of like, you know, like us to go on stage and just let it all out. It takes a lot of passion, a lot of insecurity, and a lot of faith to go out there and march beside somebody that has the same feeling you do and unify. We do that in music when we perform, when we go to concerts, everybody's there. Everybody's there for the same thing. It's a unification. The people that are protesting, that are standing up for what they believe in, that want change, they're there unified with one goal, the same goal. And that's literally, you know, the word comes back, love, to bring more love back to humanity because it's gotten lost or diluted somewhere down the line. But I think like that, that alone is a form of art. You know, I see all these, you know, I've attended a few of them myself. You know, I've, I've been there and I don't, I don't post about it because some of the things I do are just for me. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about it now just to, to make my point. I look around and I see so many people, youth, young people, older people, middle-aged people, people that are so extremely passionate about what they're feeling that's like a painting, you know, it's like a, 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 I don't know, it's, it's like a painting that can last forever. And you see some images of these things, of these gatherings, of these events, you know, sometimes our passions are, our, our, our frustration with society, with existence, with humanity will lead us to do some questionable things, just like every human being in their lifetime has done. Quoting, you know, like the Bible, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone kind of thing. Well, nobody can pick up a fucking stone because everybody's done some shit in their life. And when I say shit, it's like whatever it was that you did in your time in this earth that was questionable, you either learned from it or you didn't. But we see like buildings burn. We see materialistic things fade. And the reality of it all is all of that can be replaced human life cannot you know the experience of living cannot regardless if you lived a good life or a bad life it's your life and when something like that is just taken for reasons that are maybe i don't know i guess the word would be selfish when i say selfish that could be that could mean a lot of fucking things but it's it's gonna it's gonna cause an uproar you know these movements the passion people have it's, it's, an, it's an incredible form of being alive, and that should never, ever stop. You know, like with music, with art, there's a, there's a time for change. There's a time to grow from it. And when the opportunity is there, regardless how it presents itself, don't let it go. Stay strong with it. Stick with it. Fight for what you believe in. Music will save us all. <laughs> Yes, you're right. Music will save us all. So, you know, everybody out there, don't forget about that. Don't forget about that. And don't forget to stand up for what you believe is right. Because in all of us, we have to hold on to that. We have to do what's right. We have to do what's right for ourselves, what we believe in, what we hold true as individuals. 
So thank you. Oh, I agree. Thank you. I mean, it takes a certain type of person to take a step back and really look at the reality we live in. And it's going to be what you make of it as far as your part goes. What are you looking forward to accomplishing the most moving forward? Getting rid of my quarantine beard, getting rid of the quarantine weight I put on. <laughs> I mean, that's just a silly shit, but I think moving forward is just the never ending strive and continued passion to be happy in this life. I'm not saying I'm unhappy, but you know, just, just to experience more love, more uh, beauty, you know, that, Life, with all its flaws, all its joys, all its pains, it's the only one we're ever going to have. It's, it's the only one we're ever going to experience. It's the only one we're ever going to know right now. Make the most of it. Don't hold back. What I want for the future, what I've always wanted, what I, what I, what I strive for, to be happy, love, creative, and just you know, continue, you know, expressing myself with an art because that's my outlet <laughs> and you know what right there right there everybody continuing on that path of love and continuing to 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 find new ways to express that to to continue with that every single day i mean that's really important like as we move forward in life you know what i mean to continue to give back or to pay it forward just being there you know, experiencing these things that we deal with every day and learning from them, growing from them. That's important. I agree 100%. You know, anger is not a bad thing depending on how you use it. You know, it, it, it's okay to feel angry. It's okay to sometimes even feel hateful. But again, depending how you use it, you know, there, there've been moments in my life where I hate how I felt like the only word that can describe it is hate. Like I've hated how I felt, but I always reminded myself that, you know, this is temporary. I'll get past this, but I don't want to forget it. And that's where some amazing, powerful art comes from. You know, you know, when you, when you look back and, and you know, when, when you look, when you listen to songs like that, that, that moment I was expressing right now, while I was sharing with you. There's been moments in my life where I feel like I hate where I'm at in life. I hate this moment, you know, whether it was as a boy, as a teenager, as an adult, as a continuing growing man. You listen to songs like Search and Destroy by Iggy and the Stooges. And like, I know exactly what he's talking about. I get it. I know exactly what that is. I have that. But it's one of those keep on going, keep on going. You know, you hear songs like, you know, by... by like Johnny Burnett, you know, Johnny Burnett trio, the, you know, all by myself. I know exactly what he's, what he's, what he's singing about. I know exactly what that means. And it's just kind of like, we're, we're never, even though we, even though we feel alone sometimes, we're never really alone. It might not be the company of a human person, but art is there. Don't, don't ever let that go. Keep it going. Keep it, for, you know, keep it forward, pass it on. Share what you've learned in life with people, whether it's through poetry, writing a poem, singing about it, creating music about it, painting something because of it. You don't, we don't need any commercial success to validate what we've done. That's just a bunch of fucking bullshit. We validate what we've done when you see what you've created and you've, you, you successfully managed to get as close as you can to express that feeling. That is like, like I said, the closest thing to a touch from God. Exactly right. What positive message would you give your fans out there? Live, love, lust for life, for you, like a motherfucker. Don't ever, don't ever settle for anything. Don't be strictly anything, especially when it comes to music. Labels are for uniforms, for for. You know, some, some people will wear a label like, you know, like a uniform, like, like this is what I am. No, a label doesn't define you. That shit's for genes. Don't ever let that be for music. Don't ever let that stand in the way of experiencing or discovering new art. Just, just live, love, lust for life like a motherfucker always. Wise words right there, everybody from Edward Transylvania right there. Live, love, lust like a motherfucker. 
it's important in life that as artists, for people who create anybody out there in the world, if you want to put something out in the world, create, you know, make something beautiful, love it, lust for it, care for it, build it, let it grow. You know what I mean? Be what it, it make it what you want. It, there's no roadmap. There's no, you know, direction to go in. There's no label that you have to put yourself under. It's all the, in the way that you feel. It's all in the way that you choose to show it to the world. And that right there is what's important, everyone. So thank you so much, Edward, for taking this time to do this interview today. Thank you to everybody who tuned in to watch this interview happen. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to our Torfiend YouTube channel as we have many more awesome artist interviews on the way. To everybody out there, thank you. Thank you, Edward, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And literally, thank you for taking the time to really, you know, be involved with my crazy fucking mind. And also, thank you to Pigs Radio. We're in an undisclosed location in Compton, California, because they have the best fucking studio in town. So thank you, Pigs Radio. Yes, thank you to Pigs Radio. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, everybody. We love you, and we'll see you again next time. Remember, dream it, build it, and let it grow. And say, fuck it. <laughs> fuck it. All right. You have Cheers, a good man. rest of your day. You too, brother. <laughs>